your participation. It is now time for us to listen to the first keynote speech of KGFP 2021, titled 30th Anniversary Evaluation of the Framework Agreement between the two Koreas and Vision of Inter-Korean Relations. The speaker is Mr. Chong Se-hyun, Executive Vice Chairperson of the National Unification Advisory Council. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Minister of Unification and also the UN Secretary General talked about uh, the way forward uh, for us. In order for us to set the right direction, we need to understand today and in to understand uh, the present, uh, we must look back and reflect on the past. And so in that spirit, I would like to take a look at the basic inter-Korean agreement uh, that was uh, signed 30 years ago. I would like to talk about the background of that agreement and the implications of that agreement today. And I would like to talk about the changes in the direction of unification from the perspective of North Korea. And I would like to talk about uh, its uh, South Korea policy as well. Uh, I have actually been uh, vaccinated, so I would like to take off my mask since uh, the microphones also have uh, little covers on them. Uh, in my presentation, I have uh, many different agreements that I would like to mention and many different dates and I removed my mask so that I can clearly uh, deliver uh, what agreements and dates I'm talking about. Uh, I would like to first uh, begin in the 80s. In the early 80s, China started the process of reform and opening up. And in the mid-1980s, the Soviet Union also introduced and implemented policies of Glasnost and Petroiska. The two major communist countries at the time focused their efforts on boosting their own economies. And as a result, they stopped providing economic and security assistance to their socialist brother countries. This is what happened in the 80s and 90s. As you know, uh, in the Mediterranean island of Malta on December 3rd to 4th on 1989, the Malta summit between the United States and the Soviet Union was held. And uh, Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev proposed to U.S. President George Bush at that summit that the two countries should put an end to rivalry and confrontation. They did not declare an end to the Cold War, but many international experts see this talk as a starting point to mark the end of the Cold War between the East and the West. Since the mid-1980s, Eastern Europe's socialist regimes have started to collapse, uh, or many of them started to see a transformation in their regimes, and East and West Germany saw a rising spirit of unification in their societies. As you know, in November 1989, the Berlin Wall collapsed, and in the following years, uh, the two Germanys uh, uh, united. And this was the international environment which inevitably stirred up a sense of crisis in the North Korean regime. In particular, due to China and the Soviet Union's decision to cut off foreign aid, North Korea's economy continued to grow 0% in the 1980s. 
And starting in the early 1990s, North Korea started to post negative growth. As the South Korean economy achieved remarkable success, on the other hand, since the mid-1970s, the gap in national power between the two Koreas continued to widen. And so in the 80s and 90s, uh, the gap in the national power was quite immense. Meanwhile, on July 7, 1988, then South Korean President No tae -woo announced the Special Presidential Declaration for National Self-Esteem, Unification and Prosperity and pushed for negotiations to establish diplomatic relations with China and the Soviet Union based on his administration's North Korean policy, or rather Northern policy. So as a result, South Korea establishes official ties with the Soviet Union in 1990 and with China in 1992. So with these shifts in international affairs and the widening gap in its national power relative to South Korea, the North likely had little choice but to take extraordinary measures to ensure the security of its regime. And so, if you look at the New Year's address in 1988, you can see uh, North Korea's strategy towards South Korea changing. In that New Year's address, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung states, the two Koreas should adopt a non-aggression treaty in which East side promises not to invade the other. We should solve the issue of unification on the foundation that the North and the South acknowledge each other's existence. I think what is notable here is that uh, he uses uh, the term uh, neutral somewhere in the statement, but the point here is that uh, the North says that the two Koreas should adopt a non-aggression treaty. In uh, the late uh, 1980s, the two Koreas held prime minister talks and also vice ministerial and working level talks. And uh, the talks that took place in September 4th, 1991 were thanks to vice ministerial and working level talks between the two Koreas. President No Tae-woo in September 11th uh, proposed the unification plan for one national community. And uh, this was in response to a similar plan announced by North Korea earlier. But this plan proposed by No tae serves as an important opportunity to change the North strategy against South Korea later on. If you look at the unification plan for national community, it is comprised of three phases, a phase of reconciliation and cooperation, a second phase of the Korean Commonwealth, and a third phase, final phase, of unified Korea of one nation and one state. Uh, in the Kim Dae-jung administration, the name of this plan changes. However, the three phases remain in place, and the final phase, or the second phase, includes a Korean Commonwealth. Before uh, this plan was uh, shared at the National Assembly, the political leaders of Korea at the time, both the ruling party and the opposition party, were on board uh, with this plan. So this is considered a unification plan uh, for Korea since uh, President No tae And it continued on uh, until the No Mo Hyun administration. On January 1st, 1991, the 
minister talks were held in the previous year in December, and after these talks were concluded in uh, the New Year's address in 1991, Kim Il-sung says something rather uh, shocking. In that New Year's address, Kim Il-sung says that unification should occur under the principle that no one eats whom or no one is eaten up. And he talks about how we need a loose uh, federation system or uh, loose federal system as a direction for unification. All this demonstrates that North Korea's unification plan has transformed from the inter-Korean federal system announced on August 14, 1960, and the and the Koryal federal system, which was announced in 1973, to the proposal for founding the Democratic Confederal Republic of Koryal in 1980. And finally, the loose federal system as of January 1st, 1991. So we can see how North Korea's unification plan has evolved. Since then, the loose federal system has been expressed as the low-level federation in the June 15th South-North Joint Declaration issued during the Inter-Korean Summit in 2000. And ultimately, what this shows is that North Korea's unification plan has come closer to the core concepts of the Korean Confederation in the South's unification plan for one national community announced in September 1989. And uh, in 1991, South and North Korea jointly join the United Nations. North Korea had consistently refused to join the United Nations simultaneously. South Korea had continued to encourage the North to do so. But North had consistently made a counteroffer to attain the UN membership under a single country name as one nation following unification. However, in 1991, North Korea submitted its application to the UN voluntarily in 1991. And that year, the two Koreas finally joined the UN together at the 46th UN General Assembly. Uh, that shows a definite move away from the one Korea notion. And you can see uh, that uh, the North's view of unification changes drastically from that point on. So in December 13, 1991, the basic inter-Korean agreement was adopted and we need to take a look at it a bit more in detail. So it talks about reconciliation and non-aggression between the two Koreas as well as exchanges and cooperation and so on. There are about or a total of 25 articles in the agreement. And the first five articles were critically needed by North Korea. So the five articles basically talk about respect for each other's system and also not meddling in each other's internal affair and also no interference, uh, nor slandering or defaming each other. And Article 4, refraining from any acts of sabotage or insurrection against each other. And Article 5, abiding by the present military armistice agreement until a state of peace is realized. So basically, the two Koreas would respect the ceasefire line or the armistice line. So the changes in view of unification in both North and South Korea is can be significantly seen by the fact that the agreement actually contains the official names of the countries and the official job titles of the signatories. 
back in 1972, the July 4th North South Joint Statement was stated, and it states that Li Hurak and Kim Young-ju, who will uphold the will of our leadership. So, Kim Young-ju and Lee Hurak were the representatives of the two Koreas in signing the joint statement, and there were no indication of the country name or the official job titles before uh, the basic agreement. However, in the basic agreement, uh, signatories were stipulated as Jung won sik Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea, and Yeon hyung Muk, Prime Minister of the Cabinet of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The fact that the official name of the countries and official job titles of the signatories indicate that the two Koreas recognize each other as official nations, two separate nations. So Article 1 through 5 of the basic agreement were mechanisms to ensure that the North Korean regime uh, would be safe from South Korea. And of course, um, this also served as an opportunity for us to see how much the North Korean regime was terrified at its instability and unification by absorption. So Kim Jong-un, the chief liaison officer at the time, told me this directly. So when he was running the liaison office in the mid-80s, uh, he and I had some close relations. And when I was in Beijing in 1995, I think we had a week-long talks then, and there were a lot of breaks in between. And he and I were talking about a lot of things, and he suddenly said, you know, on the day that uh, this basic agreement was Signed, Kim Il sung sent a helicopter to Pyongyang to gather the representatives of the talks to the presidential palace. And at the entrance, Kim Jong Il, Kim Il sung stood there to greet the representatives and brought them to his room. And he said, this agreement will help us hold our enemies back. It will give us more power than thousands of troops and horses. So Choi bong Chun, the chief liaison officer of North Korea, told this to our South Korean counterpart who told me this story. So this is a very significant story. It will help us hold our enemies back. It will give us more power than thousands of troops and horses. This story provides us a glimpse of how much Kim Il-sung feared of the instability in the regime and unification by absorption. And in 1991, the simultaneous joining of the United Nations by two Koreas is also significant. They joined the United Nations under official country names, which indicated that the two Koreas officially became two separate Koreas. So, the Eighth Party Congress of the Korean Workers' Party that was held in January, the party bylaw was revised significantly. It was mostly the provisions on South Korea that were revised. To date, or up until the Seventh Congress, the party bylaw stipulated the present purpose of the Workers' Party rule as followed, building a strong and prosperous socialist nation on the northern half of the republic and executing on a national scale, national scale meaning including South Korea, the task of the national liberation, people's democracy revolution. And the ultimate purpose is, you know, communizing the Korean peninsula. But on the Eighth Party Congress, through which the party bylaw was revised and adopted, the provision was amended as follows. Building a prosperous and civilized socialist society on the northern half of the republic 
and realizing on a national scale, which means once again, including South Korea, the independent and democratic development of society. So basically, the term national liberation, people's democracy revolution has been deleted from the bylaw, which I will mention again if I have time to. So this national liberation of people's democracy revolution on a national scale had been recognized as concept of red color unification or communist unification. And based on that, uh, North Korea conducted provocations and rhetorics or slandering against South Korea. But at the Eighth Party Congress, once again, North Korea revised its party rules and used the phrase realizing the independent and democratic development of society. So the words have become much softer. So this gives us a lot of food for thought. But such change is not an unexpected phenomena. If we look at the New Year's address by Kim Il-sung in 1998, and also the inter-Korean agreement that prevented unification absorption, as well as the 1991 uh, New Year's address and so on and so on. The North Korean leader mentions that this should not be about uh, no one eating up whom or no one is eating up. And he also noted that we are willing to discuss the gradual approach to complete federal unification. And of course, uh, there are the one through five articles in the basic agreement, uh, which refrains us from slandering each other or defaming each other, which are all related together. And this is also connected to the loose form of federal system, as well as the three-phase unification step uh, that was mentioned earlier. So, in English, it would be closer to confederation instead of a federation. And North Korea has changed, uh, mentioning in many of its speeches and addresses about uh, the accepting the concept of confederation. So, with the changes in terminology in the party bylaw, some people are of the opinion that this is nothing but North Korea's disguised peace tactics against South Korea, even the most intellectual scholars. However, uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, given the unchanging dynamics in international affairs and the deepening gap in national power between the two Koreas, our GDP is over $31,000 per capita now. However, North Korea, North Korea's GDP per capita is only about $1,800. So given this big gap in national power, you know, there's no way that North Korea would still stress national liberation, people's democracy revolution. So the gap in national power and changes in international landscape and Korea's rapid uh, increase of status in the global arena and so on and so on, North Korea would have had to uh, come up with some change strategies to respond against this. So it seems that Chairman Kim appears to have concluded that it would have been a burden to present unrealistic visions such as liberation of South Korea or communist unification to the people. So recently, if we look at the Rodong Shinmun, the North Korean state-owned newspaper, so actually today is my last day as the Executive Vice Chairperson of the National Unification Advisory Council. So this will be my last day to read the Rodong Shimu. But anyway, Rodong Shimu really stresses the importance of the youth. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, and it really strictly cracks down on the youth who looks at uh, materials that are related to South Korea, for example, and that was made into a law as well. And after the economic uh, development plan was executed and Changmadang was revitalized, naturally content or culture of South Korea flowed into North Korea and that agitated a lot of North Korean youth. So the young people in North Korea's mind out to contribute to national development centering on the party, but they're becoming lax. And therefore, North Korea has conducted a lot of conferences and workshops and so on to solidify the youth. So in that sense, of course, it is impossible or it, it doesn't make sense for North Korea to emphasize national liberation, people's democracy revolution. So Kim Jong-un has recognized that North Korea is in an inferior position and to assure the stability of its regime or the status of its regime, he had to seek for ways uh, to guarantee this and therefore adopt changes. So this is not something that uh, we should just sit still and watch. We need to make use of this. I believe that at this rate, North Korea has given up a unification that is led by North Korea. So a North Korea-driven unification is impossible in North Korea's eyes. Korea, South Korea is becoming a country that is capable of unification. But in a situation where one Korea has given up unification and wants to maintain the two-country regime, would it really be correct for us to still pursue the strategy of unification? So there is a quote, Chang Ge Chuge, in the, kingdom, uh, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And this was a key tactic of which says that we should build our strategies inspired by our counterparts. So a unification policy that bears in mind the possibility of the confederation might is perhaps what we need going forward. So as time goes by, the public or the people's passion towards unification has ceased. Young people are not interested in unification. And against this backdrop, peace between the two Koreas and coexistence and formation of a confederation might have to be considered just like the European Union on the European continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chong Sehyun, Executive Vice Chairperson of the National Council, Unification Advisory uh, Council. Uh, as an expert on North Korea, he shared a lot of meaningful talks and stories on how to establish a permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula and new vision for inter-Korean uh, relationship. Thank you very much for your insightful keynote speech once again, and we would like to have a more talk on his um, topic. So now Mr. Chong jin Hon, professor at the National Institute for Unification Education, will moderate the keynote speech. So Mr. Chong jin Hon, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Chong Jin Han at the National Institute for Unification Education. I will now carry out uh, a talk with uh, Mr. Chong Se Hyun based on his keynote speech. And uh, I would like to ask you some questions, and perhaps some of them will be a little provocative, but I would like to take this uh, opportunity to ask you some questions. In the last part of uh, your uh, keynote speech, you mentioned uh, something that I would like to touch upon. I am now at the National Institute for Unification Education, so I'm educating people about uh, unification, and I was in the States for quite some time. 
in this changed environment, uh, listening to your keynote speech, uh, I came to think that we need to change perhaps the way and what we teach about uh, unification. So as a person who has to educate others on unification, I think that uh, perhaps we need to change the concept of unification, or maybe we need to change the term itself. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that we should keep the terminology and change the concept, or should we come up with an entirely new terminology? Well, that's a very good question and a difficult one. If we do not use the term unification, I mean, our ultimate goal is a unification, but if we keep using terminate, uh, unification, I think it gives the illusion that this is something that we can achieve in the very short term. But realistically speaking, unification is a very long-term goal, and I think as time passes, it will become an even more uh, longer-term goal. Uh, the two Koreas have uh, not come together very much, but we keep uh, using the uh, term uh, unification. Uh, you said you studied in Germany. Yes, I was at the Max Planck Institute. The National Institute for Unification Education uh, was established uh, in the 60s, and it was at a time when the economy started developing, and there was a lot of hope that the South Korean economy would be able to catch up with the economy of the North. And the government at the time decided that uh, education should become a national initiative and strategy, and that was why uh, that the institute was established. So at the time, the official title was National Unification Board. And so there was a mismatch in the English and uh, Korean name. But if you look at uh, Germany's case, they unified uh, uh, in about 45 years since the division. Uh, and the West Germany government had two separate uh, divisions, and uh, they had one division that was in charge of unification, but they did not use the term unification because it seemed like such an unrealistic, uh, faraway goal. So what they focused on was fostering relationships between the two Germanys. So they focused on improving relations between the two Koreas. So it was named the Inter-Korean Division, uh, sorry, Inter-Germany Division. So we use the term Inter-Korean, but they did not use the term Inter. But they used intra. So that division was uh, specifically dedicated to intra-Germany affairs, uh, highlighting the fact they were trying to foster relations between two entities within one country. And what they did essentially was uh, provide economic assistance to East Germany, and they achieved uh, unification. So if you look at history, Germany did not use the term unification, the grand term of unification, but they achieved unification. We continue to use the term unification. However, the desire for unification on the Korean Peninsula is diminishing as time goes by. And I don't think that we can do away with the term unification itself right away. Uh, but I think we can change what we teach. The National Institute for Unification Education is a uh, public organization. Although we cannot do away with the term uh, right now, uh, we do need to emphasize uh, the phases that are needed in ultimately building a unified uh, country. Unification will be something that will have to be dealt with by the future generation. At our generation, I think we need to focus on the exchange and co cooperation uh, that will be needed before that. Yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And in that respect, so for a long time, you've watched the history of the two Koreas. You are living uh, proof that uh, the Koreas have been divided for so long. 
And last year, Germany marked the 30th anniversary of its unification, and this year it marks the 30th anniversary of inter-Korean basic agreement. And I think personally, you probably have something to say about that. Uh, about the fact that it's been 30 years uh, since the Inter-Korean Basic Agreement was signed, and perhaps this brings back a lot of memories for you. So can you just share your personal thoughts or personal memories or stories? You can be a little emotional too. So at the time when the Basic Agreement was signed, to be honest, I thought that this was a tactic by North Korea to just, you know, um, to be, remain safe or to avert the current situation. Of course, it, in 1988 uh, New Year's address, Kim Il-sung did indirectly express uh, its his fear of uh, unification by absorption by saying that we should sign a non-aggression treaty and that unification should occur under the principle that no one eats whom or no one is eaten up. And then in 1991, the basic agreement was signed. And it didn't appear to me back then that this would be a start of something new. I just thought that because North Korea was cornered, it just wanted to avert the situation by signing the agreement. However, as time went by, I could clearly see that North Korea's attitude was changing. And in retrospect, you know, we have seen changes in North Korea's unification policy and policy towards South Korea changing, and we should take those changes into consideration when we deal with North Korea. If we, pers we should not pursue policies uh, based on uh, North Korea that we think we know based on our past experiences, but we should closely observe the changes that in went through for the past 30 years and shape our policies based on that. So I had no idea the inter-Korean agreement would turn out this way. I'm sorry for not having that insight. I think it's important to identify the changes uh, in North Korea. As a major in anthropology, I think we need to look at this from the perspective of uh, relative uh, culture. North Korea's South view on South Korea has changed. Uh, they no longer want to lead uh, unification. And uh, the younger generation of North Korea have actually become aware of K-pop and uh, they have been exposed to South Korean culture. But in the South, I think that uh, there is a lot of hate toward North Korea. And as you have mentioned, the younger generation has lost interest in unification. At a national level, it has been 30 years uh, since the inter-Korean basic agreement. But because uh, the unification is led by the government, it has become become more and more a distant concept uh, for the public and the situation has become very complicated and the South Korean people, some people uh, oppose uh, unification. How can we close the gap between uh, the two perceptions? The young generation of North Koreans, those in their 20s and 30s, I think that uh, their uh, sense of individualism is uh, rising. Uh, the uh, one for all, all for one uh, kind of attitude is something that the South, Cor uh, the North Korean regime uh, hopes to raise once again. But as you mentioned earlier, South Korea's generation, younger generation, are not that interested in unification. If you look at the per capita income in South Korea, I mentioned earlier 
that it is 31,000. Generally, if the per capita income rises above $10,000, that's when a lot of people uh, start to uh, foster desire for democracy and individualism. If you look at Korea, the per capita income now exceeds $30,000. So a lot of people uh, center their lives and their values and thoughts uh, around themselves, uh, their lives. And uh, for them, unification is a goal that just seems uh, like a dream. And they are concerned that unification will only entail costs. And that is why there is a lot of uh, hostility or opposition towards North Korea or the idea of unification. Uh, I don't want to talk too long about the cost of unification, but this is something that we need to think about. In the mid-1990s, uh, during the Kim Yong-sam administration, this is when we first uh, started talk about uh, the unification cost. At the time, after the passing of Kim Il-sung, uh, there was an imminent sense that there was going to be a collapse of the North Korean regime. And if the North Korean regime collapses, then uh, unification seems to be uh, the natural uh, course of events. And uh, we realized uh, that we would need money to do this. Uh, in the case of uh, Germany, the West Germany, starting in the 1970s, invested, if you will, in East Germany. And we realized uh, that the unification costs on the Korean Peninsula will be even greater uh, than that amount. And that is when some people started to think that maybe it's uh, better for South Korea if unification didn't happen at all. And this was 20 to 25 years ago. Uh, the people who are in middle school and high school then are probably now parents uh, with children who are in elementary school. And uh, in the mid-90s, uh, when the current people in their 30s and 40s were growing up, they heard a lot of concerns about the unification cost, and that is why perhaps in their generation, uh, they are not that much interested in unification. And then with the rise of individualism overall, uh, there is less interest in unification. So there is a theory that uh, unification uh, will entail massive, massive costs. And sometimes uh, this stokes fear. And Japan is the culprit behind uh, fueling uh, this theory, instilling a fear of unification in the uh, Korean people. Without carrying out a thorough analysis, at the time, simple comparisons were made about the cost of unification. In 1991, a Japanese, a Japanese bank published a report, and this was introduced in The Economist, and it talked about uh, the unification cost. And at the time, I remember thinking uh, that uh, the Japanese were really holding us back uh, when it comes to unification. And in that report, it said that the South Korean economy cannot handle the unification costs alone. Uh, so Japan must provide financial assistance in the process of unification. And uh, why would we need uh, financial assistance from Japan? And I think that we need to educate people about the cost of unification as well. Yes, you're right. What I was surprised upon coming to Korea is that more than any other country in the world, I thought that Korea would uh, conduct thorough research on the unification process of Germany, but I noticed that there were a lot of misunderstandings like the cost of unification that you talked about uh, in the process of unifying under the West Germany's lead. You know, there are a lot of costs were incurred. Yes, it's true. However, when we look at the inter-Korean relations, uh, we do not even uh, make use of the national coffer uh, to provide welfare to people right now anyway. So things are entirely different between Korea and Germany. But of course, uh, there are changes in awareness or perception between North Korea and South Korea. In North Korea, among the youth, 
they have some sort of admiration towards South Korea. However, you, South Korean youth are repulsed by North Korea. So there are differences in perception. For us, therefore, we have to, from a cultural point of view, uh, set up a correct understanding of North Korea, you know, get the correct information, facilitate uh, cultural exchange and contact with North Korea and so on. Those might be solutions. What do you think? But if we take a functionalistic approach, which was actually promoted back in the 70s, and also in the meanwhile, or up until very recently, uh, inter-Korean relations was based on these functionalistic rules. But if you look at North Korea's uh, moves towards South Korea these days, yes, it's true that it cracks down on the youth who admires South Korea. They actually execute people or imprison them for five years if they were caught to watching South Korea materials and so on. And under these circumstances, would we really be able to revitalize inter-Korea and exchange through cultural exchanges? Would we be able to really uh, provide a cornerstone for unification? Because that ha that is what we have been doing or we had been doing. But if there is a severe crackdown on the youth in North Korea, if we revitalize cultural exchanges among the adult generation of the two Koreas, would that really be helpful? So I know that Minister Lee in is having a hard time right now. We are continuously knocking on North Korea's door, but it's not opening. But before this administration is over, I'm sure the door will open wide. So please keep on knocking on that door. But anyway, so rather than providing something that would appeal to the young people, I think it would be necessary that we provide a humanitarian assistance or some kind of aid to North Korean instead. Uh, so let's say that, uh, for example, there's BTS, right? Uh, all the younger generation is raving about BTS. And that's the same for North Korean youth, I presume. So we have to be cautious of that because North Korea, like I said, strongly cracks down on the youth because of that. And our exchanges uh, cooperation would have to be based on some things that the North Korean regime would not be repulsed at, not those cultural things. And the Ministry of Unification would do that. And of course, the National Institute for Unification Education would have to take care of the youth part. But of course, we have to uh, take into account the reality I think we only have time for some final comments uh, by the executive vice uh, chairperson. As you said, uh, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the inter-Korean uh, basic agreement. And also the theme of this forum is new vision for inter-Korean relations and community for peace, economy, and life of the Korean Peninsula. So I would like to ask you for some final comments for participants. Economic cooperation and peace. Uh, may actually follow the theory of Marx. We need to build the foundation of economic cooperation first, and we can then build upon this peace. And I think that we need to, of course, uh, move forward with economic cooperation and building peace. And I believe that a systematic representation, an institutional representation of this uh, would be a Korea confederation. Of course, uh, ultimately, our ultimate goal is uh, unification, but the uh, core is uh, peace, and the way to go to that is to build a confederation first. 
Uh, I think uh, it is time for us to wrap up. Unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we were not able uh, to receive uh, questions uh, from the floor. But uh, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, the executive vice chairperson and uh, I uh, asked uh, questions uh, for the floor. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chang Sehan once more. Thank you very much for the wonderful discussions. We really learned a lot from their talk. Thank you once again. So that concludes the opening ceremony, and we're going to take about a 30 minute break from now. In 11, um, sorry, 10.50, from 10.50, session 1-1 through 1-4 will be heard in parallel. So we ask for your active participation. Uh, once again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and our viewers. I'll see you then. Thank you.